Good evening, everybody. If you're in uh, the African side of the world or my side of the world, because I'm living in Johannesburg, and good morning to people in the on the other side of the world, especially Desiree Lindeke, who has our op who is our operations manager and is going to be heavily involved in giving this webinar tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, for the first time, we've decided as a company to just concentrate. Um, we used to do webinars. In fact, those of us who joined last Wednesday, and we've got 102 booked today, which is slowly increasing. So welcome to everybody. And thank you, Ruan, as always, for organising tonight's seminar. Ruan is our marketing manager um, with Network Migration. Um, but we've always done combined webinars and, and in fact, seminars pre-COVID, where we had hundreds of people and sitting in front of us. Um, so due, due to the COVID crisis and now with technology, of course, we're able to reach a lot of people in a huge amount of countries in the world. I mean, we've got, we've got clients from the UK to China, from the USA to the Philippines, from South Africa to, to South America. So with technology the way it is today, we are able to reach clients all over the world. So what we as a company decided to do was as rules and regulations are changing quite regularly, and as these countries tend to change their goalposts quite regularly, we've decided to split our webinars. Um, and in fact, we're even going to start doing face-to-face -face seminars over here in the next month or two, or probably just after Christmas, um, because we also like the you know, the face-to-face -face contact. Anyway, so every two to three weeks, please look at our website for this. We're going to be having webinars specifically on for example, tonight's is on Australia. And then the, in, in a couple of weeks' time, we're going to be having one on New Zealand. And they'll last as long as they last. I don't foresee them taking more than 30 minutes, maybe 45 minutes. And I'll be bringing in you know, experts, not only, of course, that work for the company, as Desiree Linda Q as our operations manager, even though she's based in New Zealand, um, she manages the whole operation across the world. Um, and the team um, not only clearly do report to me, but I suppose Desiree would be called my 2IC for want of a better term. Um, although Des is also a licensed, a provisionally licensed immigration advisor, currently working under me for New Zealand. Um, and she's and and as I'm also licensed for Australia, and one of the little idiosyncrasies about being licensed is for New Zealand, if you're giving advice, you have to be licensed. But if it's Australia, if you have an office in Australia, Clearly, you um, you have to be licensed if you're giving immigration advice. But if you have a license, excuse me, I'm looking at uh, slides. If you have a um, office outside of Australia, you f you physically don't have to be the licensed advisor. Now, Desiree will become one, um, but when he when she completes her um, New Zealand licensing up in the in the next near future, she, we'll just use the Trans Tasman Agreement as I do to get her license for Australia. So I've convinced Desiree to give the talk tonight because, quite frankly, um, she's young, she's vibrant, she's incredibly intelligent, she is extremely um, um, of the same feeling that pretty much everybody that works for this company is and that we care about our clients, frankly, a lot of the times more than we care about us because this is a, this is a life-changing decision. Um, it's a decision that takes time. Um, it's a decision that's emotional, and it's a decision that we literally hold your hands all the way through. So this is the first time that Desiree has done a little mini webinar on her own. So please um, feel free to ask any questions. Please put them in the chat room. Either Desiree will spontaneously ask them. Um, oh, hi, Xenia. Xenia is one of our new new team members, also working un, uh, in the New Zealand office. And hi, Peter Lemmer. And Peter Lemmer is our New Zealand MD and my business partner in New Zealand. Um, when it comes to NMS, Network Migration Services. And Peter, I'm sure Des will um, actually uh, introduce Peter at a later stage, and I'll have to bring him into the room, Des, um, just to talk about the job search processes that Peter does, not only, of course, for New Zealand, but also for Australia, because the difference with Australia is nine times out of ten, you're going to get your visa offshore, but that doesn't mean you've got a job. And, and part of our service is to offer job search training for both countries, um, and Peter is the absolute guru on that. Hi, Tia Marie. Tia Marie is our office manager in in um, uh, South Africa, but fingers crossed, soon to be joining Desiree in New Zealand um, as the office manager working with Peter and Des and Sonica um, in the New Zealand operation. So, Des, floor is yours. Welcome. Um, I'm going to just sit here and shut up, but if you need me, just ask me a question. Thanks, Andy. Um, hi, everybody. As Andrew mentioned, I did put this slide up just so that you have our licensing details.
but uh, just as an introduction, I've been with Network Migration Services since 2015. Um, I am provisionally licensed for New Zealand and hopefully soon will be licensed for Australia as well. And really looking forward to this webinar with you guys. I just want to go back in my slides just to go over the agenda for today. Um, so we've covered Network Migration Services. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> And um, I'm just going to touch on some of the visas that we assist with. Um, but more importantly, this, this webinar is going to be covering your general skilled migration. Um, and then, as Andrew mentioned, we'll bring uh, Peter in just to discuss job search from his side. Okay. So these are just a few pictures to get um, an insight of what Australia looks like. And then the visa categories, we cover most visa categories or all visa categories for Australia. Um, the first um, image over here speaks about your skilled migrant visas, which is what this webinar will be around. Uh, but we also assist with student visas, family visas, business visas and work visas. So if you have any specific queries about these um, other visa subclasses today, if you could just pop us uh, an email to Andrew at Network Migration Services or Desiree at Network Migration Services. If someone can just please put that in the chat box. I will do that now. It's networkmigration.com, by the way. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so the visas that we're going to speak about today, you have three visa categories that fall under your general skilled migration. The subclass 189 is your skilled independent visa. Um, a lot of you, if you have a consultation with Andrew, you'll hear him call this one the blue chip visa. It's just because there's no requirement to live in any specific place. You can live wherever you want in Australia. It is a permanent resident visa and it doesn't give you any additional points. But as I mentioned, it does allow you to live, work and study in Australia permanently and gives you access to Medicare and allows your dependent children to have access to subsidized schooling. And it has a five-year travel facility. Now, I'm going to touch on the travel facility at the end of this, um, but it is important to keep in mind that, that travel facility. Um, the subclass 190 state nominated visa, again, is a permanent resident visa. The main difference between the subclass 189 and the subclass 190 is that the subclass 190 is state-specific. So the state gives you an additional five points for applying under the subclass, and then you as the applicant make a declaration to the state saying that you will live and work there for the next two years. Okay, again, because it's a permanent resident visa, you do have access to Medicare and dependent children will have access to subsidized schooling. The subclass 491 is your skilled work regional visa. It is a provisional visa, so it's granted for five years. Um, but the important thing is, is that it has a built in pathway to residence. So with this, you do have access to Medicare and your dependent children will have access to subsidized schooling because it has this pathway to residency already included in it. The caveat on this, however, is that you cannot live in Sydney, Melbourne or Brisbane. So um, there's nothing wrong with the 491. Most applicants do want to do PR up front, so your subclass 189 or 190, um, but these are all skilled list dependent, so it depends on what occupation list your actual occupation falls under. Okay, so just to touch on the five-year travel facility, a lot of people have asked uh, what that travel facility entails. It just means that for the first five years that you hold that visa, you are able to travel in and out of Australia. Um, it is a PR visa, meaning that if you remain in Australia, you will have residency. But what I like to tell clients is that you should at least relocate within the first two to three years of holding your uh, PR visa, because this just allows you to apply for a resident return visa or citizenship once you're settled in Australia, so that you don't lose out on that ability to travel. And if you'd like any further information about that, you're welcome to send us an email. Okay, so the very first step in your immigration process for Australia is going to be your skills assessment. Um, the whole application is going to hinge on the skills assessment. 
And I'm not going to go into the Skills Assessing Authority's requirements. This slide is just to show you that each occupation does have a specific skills assessment um, and a skills assessing authority specifically, and that each skills assessing authority has its own minimum criteria. So some skills assessing authorities, such as the Institutes of Managers and Leaders and ACS, might not require a tertiary qualification, um, whereas other skills assessing authorities have it as a minimum requirement, such as Vet Assess and Engineers Australia. So the requirements for each of these occupations that are covered by these skills assessing authorities is on a case by case basis. And if you would like to know more about your skills assessing authority and the minimum requirements, you're welcome to send us an email with your CV and we'll then send you the relevant information. So once you have a positive skills assessment, you're going to be submitting what we call an expression of interest to DHA, the Department of Home Affairs for Australia. And you need to have a minimum of 65, but this is, um, this is a minimum benchmark, but it's not Jesus what um, all occupations are actually selected on at the moment. So we're finding that the 65 minimum is actually a fluctuation of what um, occupations are selected on. Um, with most occupations being selected on 70 to 75 and not the minimum of 65. So this, this is a bit of a... Um, a minimum requirement, but not a realistic requirement for what EOIs are selected on. So you'll notice that you get points for age, um, 25 points for 18 to 24 years, um, 30 points. So you can actually take a screenshot of this if you'd like, uh, where points are awarded for your age bracket. Um, then you have points that are awarded for your English criteria. Um, and I know most, most people will say that, you know, competence, is um, the minimum requirement for a 189, 190 or 491 and you are correct but just because you're able to claim competent English doesn't mean that it will allow you to claim any points for it in an EOI. So what you're actually aiming for is proficient or superior. Now each, each English language test has its own minimum criteria for what, require, or what falls as proficient or superior. Um, with ELTS, it will be a minimum of six in each band, um, and seven in each band for proficient, and it'll be a minimum of eight in each band for superior. So um, it's just, it's good to try and aim high. Uh, we always tell clients to take the time they need to prepare for these tests. They're not straightforward. You do need to prepare, but just that you know what to expect when you actually write the exam. Um, again, you get points for your state nomination, so you get five points for the 190 and you'll get 15 points for the 491. Your partner can also um, give you points um, either for an English exam that they write um, or if their occupation is on the same states list and they get a positive skills assessment, they can then give you additional points uh, for having that positive skills assessment. So it's always important to know which ANSCOs you fall under um, or which occupations you fall under and the list that those occupations fall under um, when doing your expression of interest. Um, again, you get points for your qualifications and you'll get points for your skilled work experience. And I think the very important part here is that you go according to the skills assessment outcome. So we have a few people that have come to us after they've already submitted an EOI and they would have claimed all their years of experience, even though they were in different ANSCOs um, or different occupations. And unfortunately, you can't do that for Australia. You have to um, go according to the skills assessment outcome um, because that is what DHA will use when they're assessing your, your EOI. Okay, again, uh, these are points um, for your partner skills qualification. Um, you can take a screenshot of this once again. Okay, and then once you submit your EOI, um, a lot of people will do one EOI for 189, 190, and a 491, and then include all the states in that one EOI. Uh, what I like to suggest to clients is that we do an individual EOI for each um, states that they're interested in and then also to do one for each 
uh, subclass that they're interested in. And the reason for this is that when you include a state in your EOI, you're giving them access to that EOI. So you want to show them that you're actually interested in their specific state. So if you want to do a 189, I would suggest that you do an EOI just for the 189. You can have as many EOIs in the system um, as, you, as you like. And then you could do a 190 um, EOI for any of the states that you were interested in. The important thing, what I would do before you start with your EOIs is just go to each of the state's um, websites and make sure that your occupation is on that website and that it can be selected. Uh, certain states will allow you to have an EOI in and just register your interest with them and they will then select you from the pool, whereas other states you have to make an application directly to them and they will then assess that application. So important to know what the process is for the actual states that you're interested in. Okay, um, the last part of the whole application process is once you put your EOI in, you are then selected by DHA and you're issued with an invitation to apply. You have 60 days in which to take up that invitation to apply and then you make the full application to DHA with all your supporting evidence. Once you make that application, the processing time for 189 is approximately eight months, your subclass 190 is approximately 13 months, and then your subclass 491 is 16 months at present. So once they start assessing that application, um, they will either ask you for additional documents or the very first time that you might hear from uh, and the authority will just to let you know that your visa has been granted. Once your visa is granted, you then have approximately a year, and not in all cases, but in most cases, you'll have a year to initiate your visa. Um, initiate your visa just basically means that you enter Australia with your visa and that you um, initiate it as a family. You can't have your partner into Australia first. You as the main applicant will have to enter Australia with your family um, just to initiate that, that visa. And then, as I mentioned, you do have the five-year travel facility to then take up that visa and then immigrate permanently. Um, the very first thing that clients ask us after they have their visa is, you know, what now? What do I do? Now that I've got my visa, I can go to Australia, but I don't have work. I don't, um, I don't know what it, the areas are like. I don't know what housing is like. So, we like to really hold your hand through this process. And that is where Peter and the job search team become really important because we'd like you to get to Australia and already have the connections that you need in order to job search. So I'll let Peter touch on the job search process and his process of getting you ready for getting jobs once you're onshore. I'm assuming you now want me to invite Peter in. Please. Yeah, just on a couple of the questions, Clint, I mean, um, first of all, Des did not mention, well, she did actually, my apologies. Tonight, we're just concentrating on skilled migrant. I mean, we can do any visa. It doesn't matter. You're welcome, Hildreth. So just drop me an email tomorrow and, and we'll, I'll contact you and see what sort of you need. Um, and Clint, that depends. I mean, you might, Hildreth has just asked us for a, a, a cost, for example, on on helping her with the EOI. If you want the whole package and you're a family, you're probably looking at anywhere between, <coughs> excuse me, eight and a half to nine and a half thousand Aussie dollars. <coughs> but that would take you all the way through to residency, which means we'd be with you for the 12 to 24 months that this whole process takes. Um, and um, Randia, we will do that. While I'm inviting Peter in, by the way, all our consultations, sorry, all our consultations, ladies and gentlemen, are completely free. So if you want to consult with myself, um, clearly, if you're on this side of the world, it'll be with me. Or if you're on Desiree's side of the world, it'll be with her. Because we've got to have time zones. And, you know, we're, we're both parents, although my, my children are 24 and 19. Des is a uh, youngsters. Um, so, yeah, so we can happy, happily have free consultations with you. So, um and there's not a visa on the planet we can't do for you, ladies and gentlemen. So please feel free to contact us on any other issues you've got. Um, and yes, we can quote accordingly. Um, you're welcome, uh, Clint. 
Um, so, and we would we would quote, quote you accordingly, guys, because the process takes a while. Our fees you can clearly pay off, but you can't pay off government fees or assessing authority fees. Now, while I'm inviting Peter in, um, Randir has asked, and, and I know we had this question last Wednesday, Des, the vet assess delays. Can you just touch on those? Okay, so vet assess um, on both sides. So vet assess, as you know, assesses both professional occupations and they also assess trade occupations. So um, this question actually touches on some of the delays with the visa processing as well. Um, and I think post COVID, um, there was a huge influx of applications and vet assess, quite frankly, are just not being able to keep up with the influx of applications that they're currently experiencing. So for professional occupations, it means that their processing times has gone from um, 12 weeks to 20 weeks, unfortunately. Um, and then for Australia, the trades, um, they've actually requested to pause some of their trades assessments just because there isn't places available to do the technical interviews and to do the practical assessments um, for so um, it's caused a bit of a delay what TRA have said um, so TRA is Trades Recognition Australia they've said that you can still use the other um, the other agencies that are available to assist with trade assessments um, so it's important to have a look at the TRA website to see which assessing authorities can assess um, your trade occupation. Um, but Vitesses Trades at the moment is unfortunately not taking any more applications on some of the trades. There's seven trades mm -hmm. that they cover um, at the moment that they're not taking more applications in. So just important to have a look at those if you are in a trade occupation. And as a professional occupation, as I've mentioned, they've gone from the normal 12 weeks to 20 weeks. And that's just because they're just not quite keeping up with that influx of applications that they've experienced. OK, so thank you for that, Des. And guys, I mean, clearly at a free consultation, we'll run you through this. We'll run it through in detail what you know, what it is, what it's, and, and this is why we've decided to split the webinars is because things are happening in New Zealand, especially congratulations on the National Party winning, and we believe there's going to be some very positive changes on the migration side in New Zealand. Um, good luck, by the way, on the weekend. <laughs> Yay! All right, both the people I'm actually talking to, guys, are South Africans, even though they both live in New Zealand. Um, I bet they're going to be wearing their Springbok shirts, but I will be wearing my all-black shirt. I'm sure I'll be the only one over here wearing my all-black shirt. So what a game. I mean, God, those box were lucky. But Excuse me, I was going to swear then. We're lucky people on set. <laughs> one point in the last two minutes, Peter. You must have been sitting on the edge of your seat. Yeah, it was very exciting, I must say. It was, you know, half-time. I was, didn't have much hope, but boy. We uh, just, nobody did. I, no, I mean, I promise you, I was saying to the team here, I'm, I'm sorry, guys, but we're going to be playing England next week. But those box, I tell you what, they are, if they will find a way to win. I tell you, which just sums up the spring box. Anyway, Mr. Lemmer, the, uh, the, 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 the stage is yours. Okay, thanks, Andrew and Desiree. Um, yeah, well, uh, from what we do is the job search and relocation process. And you can ask sort of why do you need to do job search? Well, <laughs> the one reason is that when you land in a foreign country, you're spending your, your rands if you're from South Africa or any other currency and it comes out of your savings. So if you want to minimize your losses on savings, it's good to do a lot of preparation and networking before you come to the country. And you know, of course, which region or state or city you're going to live in in Australia. We can refine your search just to focus on certain areas. But um, I think the, the, what we do is we teach you on how to network and how to build relationships with companies and people in Australia. And with these, when you land in Australia, you've, you would have already been able to set up meetings or coffee dates, as we call them, or even interviews before you arrive. So when it's not just landing and then starting your process, saving, you know, you're going to save precious weeks there of starting to network, starting to connect with people. So you'll be landing prepared. Now, what we do is we follow the four pillar training where we work on LinkedIn, we optimize your your, cert, uh, your profile, 
and search engine optimize it. That's pillar one. Pillar two, we teach you how to connect at the right levels. And there's five different levels for you to connect on, on LinkedIn. Then we teach you how to network and market and brand yourself, which is the pillar three training. And then we also pillar four is the most important part is interview and culture training. So we teach you a totally different technique of um, of the interview training and also teach about the culture because it's totally different, more laid back people in uh, New Zealand and Australia, much more relaxed. Uh, interviews aren't that intense, but if you're not prepared for it, you might be thrown by it. So we teach you how to hit the ground running when you land that you don't waste your precious savings. So in a nutshell, you can now because the Australia process is so long, it takes you sometimes a year to year and a half to get your visa. When you get close to the period of knowing that you're going to get your visa before you travel, I'd say give at least three to four months of good um, job search training. And we can then prepare you and you can save a lot of money through just following our four-step pillar process to get you prepared and ready. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, on that subject, Peter, it's actually not a dumb idea. I mean, it's the first time we've done the webinars this way because, you know, once we receive the invitation, Des, and correct, stand to be corrected clearly, but once we receive the invitation from DHA Australia, um, you know, they're anywhere between what one to one to eight, uh, 12 to 18 months or nine to 18 months from approval. Yeah. Yes. So okay, your so, uh, first 189 is the, the fastest application at eight months, yeah. but the rest yeah, of them, yeah. the 190 and the 491 is 13 to 16 months. And one thing that Peter and his team will, and all of us do agree on is the more work you do, when it comes to touching base with your potential new employers and or your new country, um, I mean, it just augurs well. I mean, you, you, I mean, people will know you, they'll know who you are, especially LinkedIn. Our LinkedIn training is brilliant. Um, so, and frankly, I mean, I'm going to boast here. I mean, I know we've got the best job search training of any migration organisation that I know of. Um, and it's only because, quite frankly, we put a lot of time and effort and, and resources into it. Um, you know, base, basically, Peter's full-time job is helping people find work and helping people train, excuse me, helping train people how to find work and the and the right thing. And, and you know, as you can appreciate, that's a massive resource um, that, you know, Peter's time, he's been doing it for seven years now and it gets better and better and better at it. And, and the contacts that we make are fantastic. Um, you know, we get recruiters in Australia, as Desiree's just put up there, contacting Peter and myself, et cetera, to try and help them upskill uh, in Australia. Um, uh, John, an answer to that question, if you find a job before the UI has been submitted, you could potentially lodge a work visa. Um, there, are, there are multiple types of applications that you can do when it comes to getting in on a job offer first. You know, some lead to residency straight away. Some are work visas, which got a pathway to residency afterwards. Some are work visas only with don't have a pathway to residency. So I'm pretty sure you're going to email me tomorrow, John, clearly just to uh, have a look at your file. Um, but if you are selected, excuse me, if you find a job and the company is willing to go through the sponsorship process, then you could actually run them concurrently. Uh, most work visas are temporary, um, so you could run them concurrently. Have a work visa in there and wait and, and get in a little bit faster. Even work visas to Australia, they do take a while, especially if the company hasn't been pre-approved by government. Um, so, or excuse me, not government, but DHA, Department of Home Affairs. So, um, yeah, John, I'll, I, as I said, drop me an email overnight and I'll have a look at your file tomorrow and get back to you. But, um, but uh, yeah, I think it's if, if you know that when you're selected, you're, you're going to be given your visa in eight to 16 months, then the more contacts you make in that eight to 16 months, the better. And that's where Peter and his team come into it. Um, anything we're missing, guys? No. No, I don't think so. Peter? Yeah, just I mean, if you want, just want to take on the if you've already applied for your own visas and you just want the job search training portion, I can quote you separately on that just for job search training. But if you yeah, go through point. our full visa services, it's included in the network migration fees. Um, so if yeah, you I think to, I think there's quite a few people that I mean, I, I think for uh, one or two of the people that are logged online tonight um, mentioned Peter that um, 
you know, they've already got their AOI in there, for example. So they they would look at that type of service. So please either email myself or Peter. Uh, Pe clearly, it's fun job search and whatever. It's Peter. On, on anything else at the moment, it's either Desiree or myself because we're the ones that will give you the actual migration advice. Whereas don't ask me to give you job search advice. That's not my, that's not my baby and it's not Desiree's baby. <laughs> it's Peter's baby. So, um, you know, he's the absolute guru when it comes to that. And he pretty he literally does it 24-7. So, Peter and Des, thank you so much for tonight. Um, I'm sure we'll refine it, et cetera, et cetera, a little bit better, but it's it's exactly what we wanted. Um, we we ended up, funnily enough, with more people tonight listening to us on one webinar than we had listened to both last week. So that was actually pretty good. Um, so well done, guys. And, yeah, guys, please, you know, every um, Randy, what is the average time for a 482 to be approved, Des? Approximately three months at the moment. Well, hold on. Let's clarify that. The 482 sponsorship nomination by the by the employer or the application by the candidate? So just remember, Randy, with the 482, there's it's a three-step process. So the first step is that your employer becomes a, a sponsor, a standard business sponsor. So that application takes approximately two to three weeks. Once they become a standard business sponsor, they can put in their nomination application. Their nomination application and your visa application can run concurrently. So both applications take approximately three months. But if you do submit them together, then they might be approved together. Cool. I hope that answers your question, Randy. And, and Randy, please feel free to contact us. As we've said, until you officially engage us as a client, the information that we give you is free. And we're happy to do it. Okay. And happy to point you in the right directions. So, Peter and Des, have a fantastic day in New Zealand today. I, I believe you had a public holiday yesterday over the long weekend, so I hope you enjoyed yourselves. Um, and we will chat later. So thank you, everybody, for attending tonight. Please send us the emails. Francois, hold on. There hasn't been an invitation round by national government since May. Do you have any updates on the current invitation of rounds? Now, Francois, that's something. I thought there was an invitation in July, Des, or did they not do it? No, they. as far as I'm aware, they didn't do it. So just to answer that, Francois, what happened, what happened was uh, DHA updated the planning levels, as you, you'll be already aware of. Uh, but what happened was because there were so many pending applications in the system already, meaning invitations to apply that had been submitted but not yet approved in July, they had to take into account those applications that were pending to the current planning level which is why all your states were given such a small number of allocations this year round. Um, so most of your states, if you have a look um, on the states uh, lists individually, you might notice that preference is given for applicants in IT and teaching in engineering and health. So it's just because of these planning levels and the applications that are already in the system that are being processed that there's so little places available still. So states are trying to cover all their critical sectors before they actually inv invite other other occupations. So in other words, Francois, watch this space. If you've, if, you've, if, you, if, if you've emailed us or you're now logged on, Ruin's already mentioned that you'll get a, a recording of all our webinars, but we don't send out rubbish, guys. We, you, you're on our mailing list. So if you see a mail from Network Migration Services, please read it because it's quite pertinent to your potential thinking of, uh, of migrating. As I said, we don't send out rubbish. We send out p possible facts. Uh, if possible, could the nights we went be emailed to me as well? I'm having sound issues. Hildreth, no problem. They'll all be emailed to everybody that booked all 110 of you tomorrow. So on that subject, have a fantastic uh, day, you guys in New Zealand. Have a fantastic afternoon and evening. Well, afternoon if you're in an afternoon part of the world and evening if you are in South Africa or Africa. And, guys, really have a great week. And I'm very excited about the weekend. And I'm picking the All Blacks, as I'm assuming you guys are picking the box. Um, so we'll see what happens. Ciao, everybody. Thanks so much. Have a great Bye. evening. Thanks, everyone. Uh, Bye. Bye.